All right, here we go. Away we go. So we're start off in the Luke chapter two. Still talking about you know really the Christmas story. It's really good timing, isn't it? And uh, yeah. could you flip this over to Matthew, like the first chapter? So anyway, let's just start right. Let's just jump right in. There's a lot of commentary I'm, I'm going over, so just you can read it on your own. It's good stuff, just for time's sake. So I just kind of go through and see what I think is kind of relevant or fun to add in, and the rest of it I just go over. So anyway, it was during the time when Caesar Augustus decreed a census to be taken throughout the empire. And I just want to make a quick comment. The first time I went to Israel, Israel I was standing outside the old city of the wall, and I thought to myself, isn't it wild? That somebody that God spoke to somebody over in Rome to do a census that caused Mary and Joseph have to come all go all the way down from uh, Nazareth to to Bethlehem to have the Savior born where the Savior is prophesied to be born. Isn't that cool? I mean, so God uses circumstances in our life, doesn't He? So don't disregard your circumstances. Sometimes God is getting you where He wants you to go by circumstance, and He got them to go because of a circumstance. He could have shown up like He did for others. Now I want the Savior to be born in Bethlehem. So I want you guys to go out there, and now he'll be born, and then you can come back. He didn't. He used a circumstance that drew them down to the city of David so he would be born in the city that the Messiah was supposed to be born. This was the first census of Quirinius, governor of Syria. I feel like I'm reading the Christmas story at Christmas. Anyway, each journeyed to the town where their family register was kept. Joseph also, being of the lineage of David, traveled up from Nazareth in the Galilee to Judea. He had to register in Bethlehem where David was born. And if you've been to Israel, Nazareth is in the north, Judea is in the south. Nazareth is bordering the Jezreel Valley and actually the city of Megiddo, which is where they get Ha Megiddo, Armageddon, is just kind of right there. It's Har Mountain of Megiddo. So the, Megiddo is the town. It was a trade town. Just just interesting fact. And actually, the valley that uh, Elijah looked over from is that same valley, looking to the uh, east. So an interesting fact is, now think about Joseph. He's the lineage of the king, but yet he's a carpenter up in Nazareth. So, of course, David had a lot of wives, so he probably had a lot of children. So Micah 4, 5, 2. Now, this is, this is interesting. And you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, house of bread and place of fruitfulness. Think about that's the name of the city. House of bread and place of fruitfulness. Here the Messiah is the bread of life. He's coming out of the house of bread, and he is the fruitful one. The least among the families of Judah, out of you one will come to me, who is to be the ruler of Israel, whose going out has been proposed from time past, from the eternal days. 1 Samuel 17, 12. Now David was the eighth son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse. The number eight is the number of new beginnings, resurrection, regeneration. Isn't it interesting that they get circumcised on the eighth day? So it's new beginnings, resurrections, and regeneration through gematria. Like counting the letter values of the Greek transliteration of Jesus' name amounts to 888. Now, the last paragraph about Jesse's name, the very small, very last paragraph, or maybe it's not the last paragraph, depends on what you're looking at. Yeah, before 2.5, it says, also hidden, I, there's a lot of beautiful things about Jesse's name, but I, I just want to comment on, or read the last bit of it. It says, also hidden in the name of Jesus, or Jesse, is the prophetic picture of the incarnation. Isn't this interesting? Hidden in his name, in the picture name, of, of is, excuse me, the prophetic picture of the incarnation. Yahweh embracing man in his name. Yahweh embracing man. The word for man is Ish and the woman is Isha. Breath sound, Ha. Thus, Jesse also includes the Yad, or Jod, I'm sure it's Yad because Jesus is usually silent, connecting Yahweh with Ish, man. Yahweh, the incarnate man. Isn't that interesting? Yahweh, the incarnate man. Okay, verse 2, 5. Together with his wife, Mary, who was well, already well advanced in her pregnancy. And then uh, Matthew uh, 124 says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. 
he took Mary to be his wife. I remember when he got pre she got pregnant and he found out he was going to, he, he was a righteous man. He was a good man. He was going to send her away silently and not embarrass her. But then the angel spoke to him in a dream. He says, take, take her to be your wife for the offspring is not, is, is of me. And you should name his, and he calls, tells both of Mary and her, him to name him Jesus. And there in Bethlehem or house of bread, right? or place of fruitfulness, her time was fulfilled. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in stripes of clothes and laid him down in a, I love this, feeding trough. In a feeding trough, since there was no room for them in the end. Now think about it. If he was supposed to be the king, he should have came down in a beautiful, you know, marble thing with a crown sitting above, the, above it with people around, surrounded with, elegant wear and riches but he came i mean he came poor there's almost like remember in john one it says he came to his own and his own didn't recognize him he was rejected now think about it. he's even rejected at his birth he has to go and be born in a well he was in a stable there right and it's funny because it's a feeding trough and he's the bread of life isn't he he's also the passover lamb and when they eat the passover lamb he says eat my flesh and drink my blood here he is the passover lamb the bread of life in a feeding trough. Cool, huh? I mean, all the symbolism is, I mean, it's, I mean and I, I'm not even, I'm not even probably tapping into even a little of it. That's the truth. Now, there are also shepherds in the area, that area, keeping watch at the night over their flocks in the open fields. Could you go to Luke, Luke 2, please? Thank you. This is, then suddenly a celestial messenger or an angel of the Lord stood by them and the light of the glory of the Lord engulfed them. So there's a gulf by light. There's an angel shows up. It wasn't. And they were, how did they respond? They were petrified. Isn't it amazing? In the old covenant, when God showed up, they are always afraid. Now, Mary, on the other hand, was perplexed with wonder when, when, when Gabriel showed up. But every time, and they always had to say, do not be afraid. We're in a new covenant where we don't have to be afraid. Remember over in Hebrews, it talks about that we, we haven't come to the mountain, Sinai, where everything is, you know, terrified. And even Moses was shivering in fear. We've come to the new, the Mount Zion, the celestial angels of praising and celebration and oneness. That's where we are. Anyway, tw 10. The celestial messenger immediately called them and said, you have no reason to fear. I have the most wonderful announcement to make. The most wonderful announcement. This will lead to the great encounter of the most blissful, the most bliss for every single person on the planet. How many people? Every single pe person. Bliss encounter bliss <clears throat> for your savior i love this for your savior was born this day in the city of david the messiah the master your savior was born this day and now the word savior there in the greek is to make safe to deliver to preserve and to make alive. Say this. He is my savior. He makes me safe. He delivers me, preserves me, and makes me alive. Alive. Say, I'm alive. Over in Ephesians 1 or Ephesians 2, it says, he gave us the life of Christ. The same life. Anyway, let's go. And you can read about Christos the anointed, which means, you know, covered with the hand, the measure, and to measure. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 13, this is beautiful. This is so cool. It says here, the only valid measure that defines our lives is the one wherewithin God has measured us in Christ. Say, I've been measured in Christ. That's the only valid measurement. And then, he's, and then it says, one cannot measure temperature with a ruler. Can you measure temperature? This is Francois's commentary. You cannot measure temperature with a ruler. We've been measured. The only valid measure that defines our lives is the one wherewithin where God has measured us in Christ. One cannot measure 
temperature of the ruler. Romans 6, 14. Sin was your master, <clears throat> while the law was your measure. Now, grace rules. Law is not your measure anymore. Grace rules. The law revealed your slavery to sin. Now, grace reveals your freedom from it. Say, I am free from sin. Grace reveals that to me. All right, verse 12. This is how you will know him. Luke 1. You will find a little baby wrapped in strips of clothes and lying in a feeding trough. Strips of clothes kind of makes, when I think about the strips of clothes, it reminds me almost of the crucifixion, but you, you'll find him in a feeding trough. The, 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 moment, the next moment, the heavenly host of multitudes of celestial messengers joined and erupted into accolades of praise telling the God story. Now think about this. I just got to comment the rabbit trail real quick is about, you know, everybody says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, brother, praise the Lord. But, you know, praising is what? The word, any on the story of tribute and honor. It's telling a story of tribute and honor. It's telling God what he's done and what he's accomplished. That's praising him. Who he is. God's highest and gr grandest intention. Say God's highest and his grandest. That's his best intention is to do is to dovetail. Remember the dovetail joint piece is to dovetail upon earth in unbroken incarnate oneness in being human. In other words, no separation. He exhibits his delight in mankind. Say he he exhibits. His delight. I mean, I want to read it from the Amplified because I always love this scripture. Verse 14. Because it's, it's so telling. When it says, you know, the angel is saying, this is glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. And peace isn't like, oh, peace is a union of friendship. No inferiority, guilt, condemnation. Oneness with Father. That's what it is. A dovetail joint. And peace among men. I love this. With whom he is well pleased. Say this. He is well pleased with me. What did anybody do to get well pleased? He says, with man. With men. I am. Men. He's talking about men and women. Men as a species. In whom I am well pleased. We've done nothing. But he, nothing that would... You know, if we were doing our works, it would warrant being well-pleasing. We are well-pleasing. I always like to tell people that, you know, my actions, good and bad, they're not what God, makes God pleased. He's pleased with the sacrifice. He's pleased with the incarnation. He's pleased with the finished work. That's what he's looking at all the time. And we say, I was included in union with Christ when he died, when he was raised, and he ascended. All right. Colossians. I'm just jumping down here to the commentary at the very end, under 14. Colossians 119, I love this. God is fully at home in Christ, in him. Jesus exhibits God's happy delight to be human. Say this, God exhibits, or excuse me, Jesus exhibits God's happy de delight to be living in me and through me. It's his happy delight. He's so happy to, deliver, to live in you. You're his favorite place to dwell. Wow. And he was there even before you knew it. Colossians 1, 26, I believe. Then as the celestial heralds withdrew into the heavens, the shepherds immediately determined to go to Bethlehem. They went to the house of bread. And witnessed with their own eyes the prophetic word which has now come to pass as they have learned from the Lord. They're going to the house of bread, to the place of fruitfulness and visualize Mr. Bread himself and Mr. Fruitfulness, fruitfulness, fruitfulness himself. They departed with great urgency and searched out until they found the trophy, the prize. Imagine that kind of encounter. Mary and Joseph with their little baby who was lying in a feeding trough. 
wow. And just think about how, how God is building up Mary and Joseph in faith of who Yeshua, Jesus is, continually affirming what he's doing. Because he knows they're going to get the other message too of doubt. We all do, right? God does the same thing to us. He continues to affirm who you are and who you are in him and what he's accomplished and who you are and how blessed you are, how he dwells in you, how you're his temple, how you possess his mind, how he's removed your sins past, present, and the future. He's removed them once and for all as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and you're innocent and blameless because he caused it, not because of anything you've done, because he did it. Having now seen for themselves, they boldly shared the significance of their encounter and how, prof how the prophetic word was communicated to them concerning this child. Now listen to this. This is great. The commentary. These shepherds, having charge of the flocks devoted to sacrifice, would, present, would presently be in the temple and would meet those who came to worship and sacrifice, and so they proclaimed the Messiah to them. That's Vincent. That's Vincent's commentary. Maybe later it says this, but they were raising sheep and lambs for the sacrifice looking for the unblemished sheep that perfect one for the anoint for you know your the year-round sacrifice and also the the atonement and guess what they went to the feeding trough and inspected the lamb of god the unblemished lamb the lamb that god would supply of his very self for sacrifice the very unblemished lamb the one the prophetic lamb of the sacrifice of the atonement of the passover present in a person they were lamb inspectors they knew which lamb was the lamb they were raising them isn't that funny how god chooses shepherds with their background everyone who heard their story was filled with wonder like wow measure tr mary treasured all these sayings pondering them in her heart and so forming as a mental mosaic her picture of the Christ and who was to be, who the Christ was to be. In other words, who is this Christ to be? Verse 20. The shepherds returned, celebrating the marvelous events and filled overflowing with the God story that unfolded before their eyes, telling what happened and what they saw. Wow. And he picked the shepherds. I just love it. They're raising sheep, the unblemished sheep for the sacrifice. And they went to they went to inspect the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb that came out of heaven, like the bread that came from heaven, the real manna, Yeshua HaMashiach. On the eighth day, the child was circumcised, named Jesus, just as the celestial messenger told Mary before he was conceived. <clears throat> When the 40 days of cleansing were completed, according to the instructions of Moses, they went up to Jerusalem to present the boy to the Lord. Commentary. The mother of the child was Levitically unclean for 40 days after the birth of a son. The firstborn son of every household was to be redeemed of the priest at the price of five shekels as a memorial of Israel's deliverance out of slavery. Exodus 13, 2 through 12 says, Here the boy Jesus is himself is Jesus is himself the fulfillment of the prophetic picture of mankind's deliverance from slavery. Jesus is. I mean, it's what's amazing is all the prophetic, you know, they're still, oh, this one's not fulfilled. No, they're all fulfilled in the person of Christ. He fulfilled them all. 23, just as it was written in the law, every boy that opens womb shall be called holy of the Lord. If you read the Old Testament, you've read this before. And they have to be redeemed. Galatians 4, 4. But then the day dawned. I love this. The most complete columnation of time. And we divided it from B.C. and A.D. Right there, right? Everything predicted was concluded in Christ. Everything predicted. Think about that. Everything predicted was concluded, ended in Christ. It ended there. The Son arrived, commissioned by who? The Father. His legal passport to the planet was his mother's womb. Wow. In a human body exactly like ours, he lived his life subject to the same scrutiny of the law. Say, Jesus did not have a different body than me. He had a body like me. 
say there's nothing wrong with me. There's, maybe there's something wrong with the way I think about me, but there's nothing wrong with me. I am okay. I'm an image bearer. I'm a temple. I'm a child. I'm an offspring of the living God. Galatians 4, 5. His mandate was to rescue the human race from the re regime of the law of performance and announce the revelation of the true sonship redeemed in God. They... <laughs> We have visitors at our door, which never happens. It's pretty funny. Verse 24. They were then to offer the sacrifice just as the law, just as the law of the Lord said, pair of turtle doves and two nestlings, which were basically if you were poor, if you were had money, it was it was it was a lamb. For those who could not afford the lamb, two turtle doves and two dove chicks would suffice. The idea of the sacrifice was that the youngest possible animal symbolized what innocence. Most perfectly. Doves also were symbolized in this. Okay, verse 25. And significantly so that what, there happened to be a man named one who heard. Simeon, which means one who heard. I mean, think about this. When someone came up, if Simeon was coming up, he'd say, hi, one who heard. Or Jesus would be coming up, hi, Yahweh rescued. Because their names meant something. It's not just, oh, I just, I like this, I like this gal on days of our lives. Her name was this, and I named my kid. No, these names meant something. So we, it's, think about it. Here is Simeon, and his name is means one who heard. He says, there's happened to be a man named Simeon, one who heard in Jerusalem. He was a righteous man who what? Embraced the goodness of God. Wow. I think that's kind of like revolutionary right there. He embraced the goodness of God. Because you're you're talking about a time when if you did good, God bless you. If you did bad, it, it was hell to pay. I love that. Man, one who heard. Simeon, or one who heard, had a, had a Holy Spirit encounter and knew, which is, he knew. It's faith. Things come, <coughs> excuse me, faith comes by hearing, doesn't it? When God speaks to your heart, it's a gift of faith. He knew that he would not die before he sees the Lord's anointing. He knew it. He had a Holy Spirit encounter. He's one who hears. Prompted in the spirit, he arrived at the temple as the, the parents of the child, Jesus, brought him in as described in the tradition and the law. And Simeon, one who heard, holding the little child in his arms, began to speak eloquent praises to God and said, my master, I am fully satisfied. You can now release your bondservant in peace. I am holding your incarnate word in my arms. Now, isn't it interesting? We get so hooked up and we see the word, the word, the Bible, the word, the word, the word. And he's saying, well, I am holding your incarnate word in my arms. I'm holding the word, the logos, in my arms. The word is a person. The word is Christ. It's a person. It's the incarnate person. It's a person that walks so we can see what God was really like. He's the very imprint, the very imprint of the living father. So we could see who the father really was. He says, and my eyes have seen your salvation. Not my works, salvation. Salvation is a person. Whoa. Salvation is a person. It's a person. It's Christ incarnate. It's not my works or my confession. It's a person. He says, I have, and my eyes have seen your salvation. Pause. Say, look, come and think about that. Wow. You know, you know, when we've been raised up in Christian and we're always so focused on the book and so focused, even though we know it's not by works, but we still do works and we still judge ourselves by what we do and we don't do it. Here he says, my eyes have seen your salvation, the incarnation, the savior of the world, the very salvation, which prophetically and perfectly mirrors your face in every individual human life. 
as in a mirror, as we behold as in a mirror, in Christ, beholding the glory of the Lord, I see myself reflected in him. Say, he is not an example for me. He is an example of me. He is the, he is the son of God. He is the son of man. And there's no male, no female. Say, I am the son of God and the son of man. I'm not the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is. He is the savior of the world. I am not, but I am. I'm an offspring. I'm a child. Just like he is. I'm born of the spirit. So are you. And born of the flesh. Just like he was. He came in the same skin suit that you and I have. Same flesh. He walked the same way. He just thought a lot different than he did. And he walked in this union with the father and the spirit. Anyway. 32. A light. I love this. Concluding. That means ending. In the ultimate unveiling of the Gentiles now as well as the glory of his people Israel. This is an Israelite saying, wow, the unveiling of the Gentiles also, and the Jews both. Not just the Jews, the Gentiles too. Over in Ephesians, it says what? He made the two hostile entities, uh, Gentiles and Jews, one, and he abolished the hostile dividing line caused by what? The law. He abolished the law. That was a hostile border between the two. He made the two one new person i'm gonna uh, the all the commentary that i want to read romans eleven twenty six 26 is once the nation realized the full extent of their inclusion these are the gentiles then all israel shall be saved just as is written prophetically there shall come as a deliverer out of zion and he shall turn ungodliness away from jacob you know ungodliness you know what ungodliness is, is just not me not believing that i'm godly because you say i'm godly because I'm a maiden's image and lightness. I birthed from above. I'm a little, a little G. Hebrews or Matthew or Romans, John the 10th chapter. Are you not little gods? Little gods. You know, it's interesting to me when people say, yeah, not everybody's going to heaven, brother. Not everybody's going to be saved. But they always read the scripture and says, all Israel will be saved. And if I look in, 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 in our evangelical or religious Christian tradition, the way we view people, I would view a lot of Jews unsaved, but God doesn't. He says, and all Israel will be saved. That's a declaration of faith. All right. Verse 33. And his father and mother were awed by everything that was said about him. Wow. Are they having Holy Spirit encounters here? Or they have an affirmation of the child that was predicted in the Old Testament, was prophetically proclaimed by the angel, now has been born, and now other people are coming in to affirm Mary and Joseph and who they're, ten, who they're caring for. And Simeon, one who hears, celebrated them and said to his mother, Mary, know that this child will, will be laid down for the destruction and resurrection again of Israel's multitudes the destruction, and the resurrection. This will be a symbolic sign of controversy, ultimately mirroring the genius of God. My ways are not your ways. My, high, my ways are higher than your ways. His ways, are, the higher ways are by faith and by grace. Those, that's the higher way. The law is not the higher way. That's the lower way. And 2 Corinthians 5, he says, if one died for all, Paul says, all died. Colossians 2.20, I and everybody else have been crucified with Christ. We no longer live. The life we live, we live by the faith of the Son of God, what God believes in Christ, the finished work. Simeon is not saying that some will fall and some will be raised. He speaks about the falling and the rising of the same people. Verse 35, I wanted to get through Simeon to have a fresh start when we Anna the prophetess, but, and the sword shall also pierce your own soul. Then the reasonings and the dialogues and the doubtful disputes of the multitudes of the hearts will be uncovered. Now, you always hear that, you know, Mary, the sword was, she felt bad and her son was crucified and he had all this stuff. I know she felt bad, but I don't think that was the sword. I'm going to write down here, jump over the first paragraph in the in the commentary where it says one, it says the word Ramphia, and I'm not 
I don't know how to speak Greek, but it says a large, long sword. This sword is used six times in Revelations. In the Greek Septuagint, it is used for the sword of the Lord. It is an exaggerated size to emphasize its symbolic use, pointing to the prophetic incarnate word that would pierce the veiled hearts of the masses and bring to light the revelation of the mystery of Christ in them. And then in the commentary goes to Hebrews 4.12, which I love this scripture. It is so awesome. The message spoken to us in Christ is a sword. It is the most life-giving and dynamic influence in us, cutting like a surgeon's scalpel, sharper than a soldier's uh, sword, piercing the deepest core of human conscience, piercing between soul and spirit. What I believe about myself is contrary to what God believes about myself or the spirit realm, what God believes about me by faith, not by the contradictions of what I can see, by what I cannot see what God has done. To dividing soul and spirit, the sense realm versus the spirit realm. I love this. Ending the dominance of the sense realm. You want it ended. And it's neutralizing effect on the human spirit. In other words, the sense realm neutralizes the spirit realm. You're not, but the spirit, the word, remember it says, and I've, I've talked about this many times in the Bible studies, it's a message. The message spoke. The message God spoke to us as Christ is just a message. The incarnation, which is a person, is the most life-giving and dynamic or powerful influence within us. It's a message. And go back to Galatians 3. Oh, excuse me. Paul says, you know, you heard the message and this all happened. And now you're going to be perfected by the flesh. Just listen to the message. Marinate yourself in the message. Renew your mind with the message of what God believes to be true about you every day. It neutralizes the sense or the sensor on the soul realm, and it makes the spirit now becomes the dominant force in your life. The scrutiny of the living sword logos detects every detects every possible disease, discerning the body's deepest secrets where joint and bone marrow meet, the deepest part of us. Now, listen, the moment we cease, I love this. You got ready? Put up the little, what is it, the Spock ears. The moment we see for our own cease. The moment we cease from our own efforts to justify ourselves. By yielding to the integrity of the message that announces the genius and success of the cross, what happens? God's word is triggered into action. You want God's word to trigger into action? Quit trying to justify yourself. Just believe the integrity of what he's done. Faith. You know that, and there's millions of people justifying themselves thinking they're going to get the word to go into action by doing this and this exactly the opposite happens when god spoke to us in sonship god living in you in the incarnation in christ first and now in you radiates his image and likeness in our our say my redeemed innocence now listen to this i love this the word powerfully penetrates and impacts our whole being, body, soul, spirit. I'm going to say they say this. Repeat after me. Repeat that, por favor. The word, which is the incarnation, the message spoken in Christ, powerfully penetrates and impacts my whole being. My body, my physical body, my soul and my spirit. It changes me. It heals me, delivers me just by simply believing the message of the incarnation and the finished work of the cross. It is that simple. I'm just going to read just a little of that commentary about the sword at the end. The sword would also point back to mankind's original identity. Remember the sword at the, uh, when he threw Adam or Adam got expelled from the garden and he just put an angel in the sword? That's the sword he's talking about. The sword would always point back to mankind's original identity. The Hebrew word, hapak, meaning to turn about. The sword means to turn about. By implication, to change, to return, to be converted. Or metanoia, change your mind. Convert, turn back, and turn yourself to yourself again. All right. That was pretty wild. I just, that scripture is alive. So that sword 
was the word of God, the incarnation. Mary birthed the incarnate son of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the master, the savior of the world came through her uterus. Think about that. Amen.